Welcome everyone. I can't believe we're already in May. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Donna Chow and I am your host and your moderator for today's eLotus class. eLotus is the leading provider for continuing education for acupuncturists. Today's webinar is Environmental Causes of Infertility and Treatment with TCM presented by Michelle Marimore. Michelle has taught over Michelle has taught other infertility courses with us, so if you're interested in watching them, you can find her full list of courses at elotus.org. Now before we begin, let's do a little housekeeping. Today's webinar will be from 9 to 6 p.m. Pacific time, and we will have four breaks. Michelle will let you know when those are. And if you have not done so already, please get your copy of the lecture notes from the blue course access page in your account. If you want to join the chat, please do this right now set your chat to everyone because zoom already has it where by default it's only set to the speaker and to the staff at eLotus and we want to and everyone wants to be part of the conversation so as long as everyone sets their chat to everyone then everyone can see it you'll have to do this manually once again because zoom by default just sets it to the speaker and to the staff if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel. And if there's time during the presentation, Michelle will answer them for you. The quiz and the video replay will both be available tomorrow afternoon and you'll receive an email notification when they are ready. Our speaker today is Michelle Marimore, who developed the body feedback style of acupuncture, which combines palpitation with classical point prescriptions, essential oils, Chinese herbs and nutritional supplements to address health concerns. She is regarded as an acupuncture innovator for incorporating functional medicine into her practice. She uses functional medicine to get to the root problems in difficult cases and provides several treatment options so that patients can choose the treatments that are most comfortable for them. Now let's get started with today's webinar and welcome Michelle Marimore. Michelle, please go ahead and take over now and share your PowerPoint. Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's really nice to see some uh, names that I recognize, and um, I feel really honored to be here to um, share the information that I've been gathering over the last few years and um, just expand people's awareness of both the body feedback system and kind of what's going on with our environment and how we can look at it through TCM terms. Um, one of the things, let me make sure I get my, keep my chat up. Okay, perfect. I like the class to be interactive as much as possible. So if you guys would like to um, ask questions, feel free to do it at any time. If you have a comment, if you've had something you've experienced in your clinic that you would like to share or that you would like more information on, please just um, like put the comment in the chat whenever you'd like. The writing on the screen is too small. Okay, so what I'm doing here, let me see if I can get backwards. Okay, so um, I just wanna go over the handouts really quick that we have um, that you guys can pull up on your own. So these are part of the uh, course notes to download so that as I'm going through the body feedback presentation and you're kind of wondering where some of this information is compiled in an easy to uh, follow organized format, then you can go to the appendixes. So I will be referring to those throughout the class. Um, for anybody who's new to the body feedback system, I'd like just to kind of share for about three minutes how I developed it or kind of what prompted me to develop it. And you will see references to different parts of it throughout the whole class. Um, there is a introduction to body feedback class on eLotus if you'd like to learn more about the system. And then I do have my recently published textbook. I have a few copies here. If anybody would like a signed copy, I can mail out or you can get it on Amazon if you'd like to learn more about the system. Basically, um, I'm, able to, I'm unable to view PDFs. Okay, I can definitely email them to you for sure. So I will do that. Um, so basically, 
I used to be an accountant for about 15 years before becoming an acupuncturist. And in the accounting field, we always checked our work. Um, there was mathematical kind of equations or games that we would play to check our work to make sure our work was correct. And when I went to acupuncture school, there there was like no checks and balances for picking points and knowing if I had the right herbs. And it was all based on clinical experience and kind of what the book said. And I got to school and I was like, well, how do I know this is the right point? And my probably drove my clinic supervisors crazy because I was like, well, how do you know that's right? How, how do you know that's the right one? So what I did very early in my practice, starting actually while I was in acupuncture school, is I started to gravitate towards palpation-based systems. So I am, followed Kiko Matsumoto for about uh, five or six years. So there's a, like a little Kiko-esque in there, but then I also followed um, some other palpation-based systems that use more pulse uh, diagnosis. So you'll see some of that in my system. So I've kind of incorporated um, what I learned over the years early in my career, and I put it in a really easy to follow format. Um, and I've been working on putting together all the notes and making it easy for you guys to learn it, but it's pretty much step by step by step by step. And and it's the same steps for every person. And so we'll go through those steps throughout the day over and over again. So just kind of go with it. The first time you see it, it might be like, wait, what is she doing? And the second time you'll, you'll follow a little bit more and more. Um, and also I am seeing such a emergence in infertility issues related to environmental toxins in part because of the recycled clothing. So the skin is the largest organ of absorption and people are <clears throat> thinking they're doing the right thing and buying these recycled yoga pants and different recycled clothing that's made from BPA uh, water bottles, basically. So I'm seeing this in my practice quite a bit recently since the onslaught of this recycled clothing movement. And I think you guys are going to see quite a bit of it in your practice if you haven't already. And I'm going to um, show you different ways you can identify what's going on. So anyway, Appendix one is just uh, basically a summary sheet and appendix two, um, yeah, that's got the supporting points on there. Okay, perfect. And appendix three, when I started teaching this in person, I realized a lot of people's, the points that they were used to using in clinic were very different than the body feedback point selections. So I included, um, um, basically master charts here so you guys know where to find these points. So if you're not familiar with a point, know that I have it um, detailed here uh, how to needle it and where to find it. So anyway, that's that. I just wanted to go over those appendixes real quick. And now let's get into the slideshow. So how do I get out of here? Okay, great. So now we're going to be starting the actual class. So we're going to look at environmental causes of infertility and treatment with TCM. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. If you're out of the United States, it's I can check the shipping to Canada depending on where you're at, but usually it's easier just to order it on Amazon. If you want the book, you can get it on Amazon locally. Okay, so let's talk about what are endocrine disrupting chemicals. Endocrine Endocrine disrupting chemicals are found in plastics, personal care products, drinking water, food and beverage containers, clothes, construction materials, and more. Endocrine disrupting chemicals, get this out of the way, are now found everywhere in the environment due to groundwater contamination, landfills, and manufacturing disposal of chemicals. In 2015, the first report of detectable concentrations of um, PFAS, they're referred to as um, PFAS, PFAS um, in the Antarctic marine mammal species occurred. PFAS are, um, get this, uh, the PFAS may be due to long range atmospheric transformation, or excuse me, transportation or a local source. So basically what they did is they found these endocrine disrupting chemicals in the animals up in the Antarctic and they're not sure if it's coming through the rain, the trans transporting of 
um, water through the rain process or if there's some kind of local contamination. And let me get to the next slide. Guess we'll do it this way. Studies suggest that exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals during fetal development causes alterations in the structure and function of the reproductive system, diminishing the next generation's ability to conceive. So this is something that I struggle with some of my clients and some people, unfortunately, I have not been able to help. And I do believe that the reason is that they were exposed to large amounts of endocrine disrupting chemicals when they were developing in utero in their mother's womb. And unfortunately, we're going to start to see this more and more frequently because of the um, onslaught of all the plastic and chemicals in the environment. Those generations are starting to kind of um, come up. So basically, I will have people commit to three to six months of treatment and work pretty aggressively to see if I can, can get them to start cycling regularly. As long as they can start cycling regularly, I think there's some hope. But if after six months I can't get them to cycle, then I just, you know, explain to them that I don't think that I'm going to be able to provide them the solutions they're looking for um, and, and go from there. So endocrine disrupting chemicals imprint the DNA and they create gene mutations that may persist for generations and possibly forever, even after removing the chemical exposure, causing increasing infertility rates in younger women and diminished sperm quality and quantity. So, so that's the problem. So a lot of times people with um, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, each generation, it's getting harder and harder for them to conceive and, and have a healthy pregnancy. Um, so this is the science behind it, basically. Endocrine disrupting chemicals are associated with common causes of infertility, including both excess and deficiency pathology in TCM differential diagnosis. Endocrine disrupting chemicals are external pathogens that can con cause complex organ and endocrine gland dysfunction. So when I started looking at how do we analyze these endocrine disrupting chemicals and how do we look to treat them, uh, I realized, okay, first of all, it's an external pathogen is how we have to look at it um, and kind of start to go from there. Endocrine disrupting chemicals have been linked with premature ovarian failure, early menopause, ovarian dysfunction, endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome, fibroids, and unexplained infertility. So here we have the pyr and polyfluoro. I can't pronounce some of these chemicals. I'm just going to let you go know that right now. And I just use the abbreviation, the, the PFAS, PFAS. PFAS are used as repellents and coatings for common products, including cookware, carpets, and textiles. So that's cloth, that's uh, fabrics. Training exercises using firefighting foam pollute the environment with substantial quantities of PFAS. PFAS are known as the forever endocrine uh, EDC because they do not disintegrate uh, and therefore continue to accumulate in the environment over time. So this is a big problem. We have um, an airport here in Madison, a little airport, and you can look up on ewg.org, Environmental Workers Group. Um, they have a link to uh, uh, the PFAS website where you can look uh, on a map, on a scalable, I think it's a scalable Google map of all the sites that have been reported to have contamination from PFAS, and they're usually around the airports. So if people look, um, look up their information, it's good to know in your area because what are your clients dealing with? So I have a lot of clients that live kind of by the airport, and I first thing I've got to do is switch their water. And I have to be able to explain to them why they have to start paying for um, high-quality spring water. Um, so this website has been very helpful, the ewg.org. Um, how many people, I'm just curious, use the ewg.org um, their website, they have one for looking up uh, cosmetics, 
and looking up endocrine disrupting chemicals in um, personal care products. And then also the water website, yep, use it for cosmetics. This is a great site and it's a nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan, nonpolitical organization. So it's, it's great to be able to refer everybody to them. So we will talk about that later more too. But everybody should know kind of what they're dealing with with their water in their area. So PFAS mimic fatty acids and change the structure of cholesterol and hormones, causing severe adverse health effects. Studies on PFOA exposure found a probable link with six disease categories, high cholesterol, thyroid disease, ulcerative colitis, testis testicular cancer, kidney cancer, and pregnancy-induced hypertension. So the fact that these PFOBs basically alter the hormones is critical when you're dealing with enhancing fertility. So a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is how do we convince people, and the body feedback system has worked great for, uh, having people bring in samples of their water. Whenever I have a new client, I have them bring a glass jar of their tap water their fil in their filtered water. And then I use the body feedback testing techniques, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And I actually test their water. So I have all new clients and, and I recommend everybody start doing that too. So we have a click, clicked on the link. It's a bad link in the website. I tried to link on the PowerPoint and it says missing. So hopefully uh, somebody at eLotus is following up on that. Let me know if you don't get that. Okay, high, higher PFAS exposure correspond with later menarche, irregular menstrual cycles, longer cycle length, earlier menopause, and reduced estrogen and androgen levels. So if we looked at that from a TCM standpoint, okay, well, the later menarche would be maybe an essence deficiency. Longer cycle length looks like deficiency. Early menopause almost looks like deficiency, right? Reduced estrogen and androgen levels. It, it almost looks like a deficiency pattern from a Chinese medical standpoint, but it's not. It's a, it's a excess pattern. It's like a true excess creating so much stagnation that it looks like deficiency. So that's why it's so important to properly identify the clients that are having issues with detoxing these endocrine disrupting chemicals or who's exposed to really high levels of them, because otherwise it almost causes a problem with our pattern differentiation that we use in TCM. PFAS can cause diminished ovarian reserve, reduced endrog, uh, engine, I think that's supposed to say, yeah, reduced endogenesis hormone synthesis that they use in IUI and IVF. So again, it looks like a deficiency pattern, but it's really, it's really an excess of this almost kind of like phlegm type pathogen, external pathogen that's clogging the receptor sites on the cells. So that's what happens is these endocrine disrupting chemicals get into the cell membrane and they get stuck there. And so then the good hormones can't get in and it looks like deficiency patterns. Um, PFAS, PFOBs have been found in follicular fluid demonstrating their ability to pass through the blood follicular barrier. So some of those chemicals will definitely get through, but they, they clog up this, the cellular receptor sites. And you guys will see that in the questionnaires coming up. So this is a really important concept to start to incorporate in your differential diagnosis is, is the deficiency secondary to the excess and the stagnation of, of phlegm and blood and, and whatever else these endocrine disrupting chemicals cause because in practice, we always have to get rid of the excess first. It's really important to remember you can't tonify on top of the excess when it comes to fertility. It just doesn't work. 
Okay, so then the next slide. We're gonna get through these chemicals really fast, I promise everybody. I know this is kind of the boring part, but it's just a good awareness. And then we're gonna get into some fun case studies and um, some stuff that's a little more interesting. So we just gotta get through this. So how do I test the patient's water? I don't send it to a lab. I actually just use my body feedback testing methods, which I'll explain as soon as we get through the chemical stuff, I'll kind of give everybody an overview on how that works. Um, BPA um, by Fisnol A, BPA directly contacts food through plastic packaging, can linings, jar caps, inner coatings. BPA can enter the body through ingestion, inhalation, and transdermal absorption. So transdermal absorption, this is key here, guys, when we're talking about the recycled clothing issue. BPAs can absorb in through the skin. So there's studies that show that that can happen. Um, and yeah, I don't know what's going to happen with this clothing industry, recycled clothing industry. So the primary sources of exposure to BPA include food packaging, indoor dust, dental materials, healthcare equipment, thermal paper, toys, and articles, articles, what did I say? articles for children's and infants. And like I said, I think this is what's causing a much larger number of people struggling, struggling to conceive nowadays is with the recycled clothing. Um, oh, no, you're fine, Ben. You're, you're fine. This is kind of the boring part. We're going to get to the good part soon. So BPA activities... Um, uh, BPA activates several immune pathways involved in autoimmune diseases, including hyperprolactinemia. Hyperprolactinemia is when the person's making uh, too much prolactin. So prolactin, elevated prolactin, diminishes FSH and the the part of the cycle that matures the egg. And then it also is driven by LH. So then if the body's making too much prolactin, it's not making enough progesterone. So this is really important um, for obviously conception and repeat miscarriage. I see most of my people with clothing sensitivities, and we have a case study using clothing sensitivities, will have autoimmune type presentations in the endocrine system. And we'll talk about that in detail, but this is a really important slide to understand when there's endocrine disrupting chemicals that basically mimic estrogens, they get stuck in the cells. The immune system is trying to clean it up. It's trying to get rid of these chemicals. It, it knows that it's damaging the cell and it's creating all kinds of problems. And then the immune system says, well, okay, what glands make estrogen? And then the immune system starts attacking the endocrine glands. So it's what I've seen in my practice. And it's um, often it's the thyroid that gets attacked or the pituitary because the immune system's like, well, if we can't get rid of all this chemical estrogens, we got to get rid of the source that's making the estrogens. So the immune system will actually start to attack the endocrine glands. So I'm going to teach you guys how to identify this, how, how does the red flags for when this is happening, and then actually how to effectively treat it and educate your clients so that they understand what's going on and the importance of the changes they have to make in their lifestyle. So this is really important stuff. And this is a lot of this class is, is going to be kind of using this in practical terms. Okay, let's read it again. BPA activates several immune pathways involved in autoimmune diseases, including hyperprolactinemia, estrogenic immune signals, cytochrome P450 enzyme disruption. So cytochrome, cytochrome P450 enzyme disruption is basically the liver detoxification pathways. So this is going to show up for us as 
um, liver excess, um, some type like a swollen liver. Often it's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, just the liver's not working right. So it can't detox the chemicals. And then immune signal transduction pathway alteration, which is basically activation of the TH17 receptors, mac macrophages and lipopolysaccharides. When the immune system, like I was saying, realizes that it can't get rid of the um, BPA, and then it starts to send out these very destructive cells, which is which are the Th17 cells, thymus helper 17 cells, and the macrophages to go and start destroying the surrounding tissue. And then that's when people get the activation of the auto, autoimmune type presentations with the endocrine glands. And one of the biggest problems is in Western medicine, they don't have any way of identifying which glands or which tissues in the body are being targeted by the immune system. I don't know if it would do much good because studies and clinical uh, application shows that when people have one autoimmune disease, they often have multiple autoimmune diseases. And the longer the immune system stays out of balance, the more autoimmune conditions they get. So it's, it's um, something that we as holistic practitioners can make a huge difference in um, and I'll teach you guys kind of how I do it. But this is, this is how it happens. Further investigation co correlating autoimmune disease development and progression to BPA exposure is needed. So let's see here. BPA contributes to female and male infertility, precocious puberty, hormone dependent tumors such as breast and prostate cancer and polycystic ovarian syndrome. So this BPA is very, it's very serious. And like I said, that's where in the clothing, we're going to, you guys are going to see this. Um, I think a lot in your clinic now that you're aware of it. I'm just curious how many people in this class have started to put together the problems with this recycled clothing and even just how polyesters have been manufactured in the last 10 years has changed. So polyesters from like the 1970s and 1980s were made different. I'm not sure exactly when they changed it over. Um, I did research it a while ago, but there were there was a point in time where the manufacturing of polyesters shifted to using more of these endocrine disrupting chemicals in the process. Um, I believe that um, pretty much all the polyester you buy new today is, is contaminated. So, okay, Jeannie, great. So anybody else seeing this um, in practice? You guys will start to see it now because it, it'll be on your mind. Um, with assisted reprodu reproduction procedures, BPA exposure negatively impacts peak serum estradiol levels during gonadotro uh gonadotropin stimulation, the number of retrieved and fertilized oocytes and implantation. So in some of the European countries, they're starting to actually do urine testing on people before they do IVF because of this problem with BPA. So what we can do is we can do something kind of similar and detox people and get them in a better state space before they go through IVF or IU, IUI procedures, um, which is kind of what I recommend to clients that I can't shift their cycle. So when, if I have somebody that I suspect is reproductive endocrine system has been damaged by endocrine disrupting chemicals from in utero time, and it just doesn't work right, I tell them that there's a good chance that we can get them cycling you know, from a holistic standpoint, if, if the body was not permanently um, kind of the programming for the endocrine system wasn't permanently damaged in utero. So I tell them that basically sometimes it is permanently damaged and there's holistic medicine can't help. 
and you know, you might end up having to do IUI or IVF, but we can detox the body, get the chemicals out as much as possible. And studies have shown that there's a much greater success rate. If you do have to go through IVF, if these chemicals have been removed from the body. And so that the time that they're going to spend with me and using acupuncture su supplements, Chinese herbs is going to benefit them, even if they do have to go down the Western route so that they know that their time and their money is well spent, no matter what the outcome is. So it's really good to kind of let people know that up front. Um, and uh, we can do that. <laughs> Fun. Yep. Can't wait to know how the endocrine disruptors are the culprits. Yeah. It's really cool to kind of see this. All right. And then somebody was at a conference seven years ago where the head of the environmental worker group, EWG, did an amazing lecture on BPA. Yeah. So there's one lab that I use for testing chemicals in um, its Great Plains Laboratory out of, um, I think it's Missouri, and they do urine testing for toxins. So um, you can kind of see some of the toxic load that way. So now it gets even worse, guys. We thought BPAs were bad. So then I'm going to start making BPA replacements known as BPS, BPF, BPAF, and BPZ, which may pose similar or higher health or similar. Yes, yeah, similar or higher health risks. BSP promotes estrogenic activity, anti-androgenic activity, pro-arrhythmic effects, and hypothalamic neurogenesis. So basically it just disrupts the endocrine system, okay? It, it just messes up all the hormones. It messes up the command center, which is the hypothalamus here in the brain. Um, and the body can't figure out what to do. BPF demonstrated estrogenic, androgenic, and thyroidogenic properties. So that's the thyroid. Um, BPAF is reported to cause more potent toxicity in cells, binding more strongly to estrogen receptors and have more effect on gene expression compared to BPA. BPZ and other BPs also have structures similar to BPA and may show similar toxic effects. It's just that we got to get away from these plastics is basically kind of what's going on. Let me get you. There we go. Um, we got to get away from these plastics. So it, it's hard. It's, it's it, in our world, the way it is today, you got to get creative. Great. The liver metabolizes BPA into bifisnol A glucurana, gluco, glucuronide. I think that's how we say glucuronide um, for excretion in urine. So that's where they can pick it up in the urine testing. So basically the liver metabolizes the BPA for excretion in the urine. One study recommends clinical tests of BPA concentrations in the urine to evaluate exposure and the risk of certain endocrine disorders and health concerns. Because of constant daily exposure and bioaccumulation tendency, attention to BPA monitoring is important. So bioaccumulation tendency means that it builds up in the body, it builds up in the cells, the body can't get rid of it, it starts storing it in fat cells, and it just builds up and builds up in the body. And in the case study that we're going to go through today, the first one, the woman, I was trying to ex explain to her why her clothes are causing her to not be able to um, get pregnant and, and to not miscarry. She keeps miscarrying. So she's like, but I, I've been wearing the same clothes for a long time. I don't understand why you're trying to tell me my clothes are not working now. And I'm like, because it builds up in the body, it accumulates in the body, the body can't get rid of it. It stores it, stores it, and stores it. And then basically there's a tipping point where endocrine dysfunction occurs and then you can't get pregnant and you can't carry your pregnancy to term um, because of this bioaccumulation. So it's important to understand that 
they've got to get rid of it. It's built up in their system and we need, we need time to detoxify it. Um, we definitely need a couple of months to get it out of their system. Okay. Uh, PCBs, PCBs known as chlorinated hydrocarbons were manufactured in the United States from 1929 until they were banned in 1979. However, they still circulate in the environment today. Due to their non-flammability, uh, chemical stability and high boiling point, the electrical insulating property, oh, and electrical insulating properties, hundreds of industrial and commercial applications utilize PCBs. So this is where it's in the construction materials. They find a lot of uh, PCB type um, exposure comes through house dust. So that's where it's coming off the electronics, it's coming off of the, the construction materials. So it's really important to have, I think, air purifiers um, and to be able to take care of the house dust. Phthalates occur in products containing PVC resin, including vinyl upholstery, shower curtains, food containers, and wrappers, toys, floor tiles, lubricants, sealers, and adhesives. Cosmetics, such as perfume, eyeshadow, moisturizer, nail polish, hairspray, liquid soap, and pesticides can also include phthalates. Phthalates are easy, easily released from products into the environment as they degrade. Phthalates naturally degrade outdoors and therefore do not persist in the environment. So this is some of the older chemicals. Um, and this is what you have to be concerned about though in, in uh, facial products. This is where you're gonna want all your clients to take a look at whatever cosmetics they're using and run it through the ewg.org website because they will find out if there's phthalates in their products or how toxic their products are. And, you know, if you can imagine you're putting chemical stuff right on the face, that's the major hypothalamus and pituitary glands that are being affected in the endocrine system. And you guys are going to see in a minute why that's critical to, to um, the whole endocrine system. Phthalates have been used in plastics for over 70 years and are associated with premature ovarian failure, failure decreased fertility, adverse pregnancy outcomes, and gynecological cancers. During prenatal and postnatal periods, so that's during, you know, when the baby's in the womb developing, phthalates can interfere, interfere with the HPG access. That's the hypothalamus pituitary gonal access. So that would be ovaries for women and testes for men. So unfortunately, a lot of like unhealthy lotions and things that women were putting on their belly for stretch marks were, were actually disrupting their unborn baby's reproductive systems. So it's just very sad that people's lack of awareness and, and what's out there in the environment is caused these future generations to have so many problems. So I think this is part of what we could have been seeing also. Phthalates disrupt the signaling of the membrane, uh, the membrane receptors for gonadotropin releasing, luteinizing, and follicle stimulating hormones. So these are the main hormones that are involved in um, maturing eggs and also making sperm. So as you can see, if the receptors, the receptor sites, are disrupted. I don't know if they're shut down, if they're clogged. I'm not sure how they're disrupted, um, but then it's not going to respond to follicle stimulating hormones, which develop the eggs and make the sperm and luteinizing hormone, um, which helps with ovulation and progesterone production. So we have fish farmeries show fish with high concentration of PCBs so that EWG org link is helpful for us to look up safe, safe fish. 
That's true. Unfortunately, our um, environment is so polluted that we're seeing it in the, the fish and people are trying to, you know, use fish and fish oil because it's such a healthy food, but then they're just getting more and more toxic. Um, it's a big problem. And also what they're feeding the animals. So just make sure you're getting um, fish from a reputable source. So this is a really interesting um, study that I found and it kind of helps to understand things. So endocrine disrupting chemicals um, in environmental causes infertility. This is like a summary sheet. So BPAs are known to decrease estrogen levels. And I think that's because they clog the estrogen receptor sites and the body downregulates the estrogen. PCBs diminish anti-malarian hormone concentrations. So that again, will make people look like they're deficient, but maybe they're not. BPAs, parabens, and phthalates reduce antrophollicle count. So this is really big for people that are going to have to go through IVF. Um, BPAs, triclosan, phthalates, and PCBs diminish oocyte quality. So there's your egg quality. PFCs and PCBs uh, have lowered fertilization rates. BPAs, phthalates, and PCBs decrease implantation rates. Triclosan, PCBs, and BPAs reduce embryo quality. Parabens and phthalates lowered the rate of clinical pregnancy and live births. So as you can see, this is a huge problem for our clients that are struggling with getting pregnant. And like I said, who knows where we're going to be in, in 20 years from now. Oh, whoops. So, okay, let's, let's take a minute to talk about um, what the body feedback system is before we go into the next technical slide and we can have some fun. And I just need to watch my time for breaks. Okay, we got time. This is perfect. So the body feedback system is basically, it's a technique that uses a kinesiology-based palpation testing for clients um, to use their body as a way of guiding the treatment process. So basically what I do is I am listening to the person's body to explain to me what it needs to heal and where the root of the problem is. Because I believe that the wisdom within the cells is much greater than my educational background and what my clients tell me. Um, in my practice, I spend as little time as possible talking to the people about their problems. I mean, I wanna get a basic understanding of it um, but I believe that if I get them on the table and then I let their body guide the treatment process and their body tell me where the root of the problem is, they'll get much better results. And basically it uses changes, involuntary changes and muscle tone and tension and pain to identify like alarm points or problem areas. So basically the client lays on the table. It's, it's critical that we take kind of gravity out of the situation. So they're, it's not like they're doing it sitting up. They've got to be either in a zero gravity chair or laying on a table and they're relaxed and they're just laying there. And I can press certain acupuncture points or I can test certain essential oils or supplements or herbs and the muscle will tighten up or it'll relax. So it's really obvious to the client on the table that their body's changing and they're not telling it to change. And so it's not like the muscle testing that goes like that at all. That never worked for me for some reason. I never even really got into it because I, I just like didn't feel right to me. But basically there's master points that are in the upper shoulder area that I use a lot. And you'll see that in, um, in the slides coming up, but there's a master hormone point, which kind of comes off of SI 13 off the edge of the scapula, that if there's any problems in the endocrine system, there'll be a, like a tight knot there. Um, and sometimes if it's been there for a long time, if I kind of palpate over it or rub over it, it, there's so much fascial adhesion that it, 
it feels like going over bubble wrap. Um, and the person can feel that and it's usually quite painful. And that indicates a long standing endocrine imbalance. The, the neck muscles right through here are a great way to, to test. When the person's laying on the table, their head has to be properly supported so that their neck muscles are not engaged. They're kind of flaccid or loose. And then what I do is I place either supplements or essential oils in the upper abdomen. So right here, and I'll explain how that works. So I'll place stuff right here and, and then give it about 15, 20 seconds and repress the neck muscles or the SI 13 or some of the other muscles will go over as we get into the other slides that are alarm points for other endocrine glands. So I use my favorite one to use is the neck muscles. And it's because of the thyroid is basically the last endocrine gland in this funnel before the ovaries. So I, I know if I clear the thyroid, then the ovaries should be, should be good. So a lot of times I'll use the neck muscles for testing. So the question earlier is how do we test the water? So um, I don't know if there's good testing, like lab testing for water. And I don't want people to spend their money there. I'd rather have them spend their money on actually good water and good food, organic food. Um, I'd rather them use their dollars someplace else. And, and I don't know if the testing would be that accurate. So what I do is I do the body feedback testing. And basically, um, I have them laying on the table and I put the water on their upper abdomen and I will then press the neck muscles. And if their water is unhealthy or toxic and for some reason, it'll tighten this up really, really tight and it'll be very painful. Um, and if the water's okay, then this will stay relaxed or usually it relaxes even more because most people are dehydrated. So when I place good water on their abdomen, the neck muscles will actually relax. So that's one thing I do with everybody is I test their water. And then now I'm testing everybody's cell phone for EMF sensitivity, which is tomorrow's class. Um, but that's one of the first things I do and how the body feedback system works. And I have this a whole chapter in my book about this, but basically what I tell my clients is that the acupuncture meridian system runs off a of frequency. So it's how the body moves energy and it's, it's energy that basically sends the signals for organs to function a certain way for the reproductive organs to work right. It's this energy that initiates the signals and the acupuncture meridian system, the fact that it, it works off of moving energy around energy is measured in frequency. So every meridian has its own special frequency that it's resonates to if it's healthy and when I'm doing the muscle testing or pressing on the points, basically what I'm doing is I'm introducing a different frequency to the body. If it's beneficial for a particular meridian or for the meridian system in general, then the alarm points that we can identify or test will relax. They'll feel, um, there'll be less pain and discomfort. It, it'll feel fine if it's beneficial. If it's not beneficial to the meridian system or to a particular meridian that's got a problem, then it will cause pain and tightness in the muscle and it will, it will tighten up the muscle group or the actual alarm point that I'm checking, making it tighter. And, um, and that's basically how it works. Now, remember if the meridian system is, is a system of flow between the, the 12 meridians and the extra vessels. And if let's say the weakness or the, the person's problem is in the large intestine meridian, which has to do with both detoxification and stages of detoxification and the immune system. So if the person's weakness is in the large intestine due to last end stages of detoxification and as an acupuncturist, we just go in and start detoxing the liver and dumping the liver and then the, the liver is dumping these toxins but they can't get out because the colon's not working right it just makes everything worse so in that case what is considered a good supplement maybe for liver support and liver detoxification 
might test negatively for somebody because their body can't process the end stages of detoxification. And that actually is our second case study today is, is that's what's happened with her. So what might be like what you think is a really great supplement might not be a great supplement for somebody else. And so listening to their body will guide the treatment process and the selection of what's the best supplement and where the problem is. Because I think a lot of people who have detoxification symptoms from like detoxing where they get like brain fog and fatigue and headache and nausea. I think a lot of those people have issues with end stage detoxification out of the colon. And when I detox people and I make sure their colon is working right, they don't get those symptoms. So, and then they respond really well. Um, and then they see really quick changes. So it's important for me to know, does this person have problems in the colon? And I do that by checking the ileal tibial band on the side of the leg or in the lower right-hand quadrant of the, of the abdomen is the colon organ alarm Point. And then uh, obviously the pulse position that goes to the lung and large intestine. Those are the main areas, those three areas I check to make sure that the person can handle the end stages of detoxification. And we're going to talk about the importance of this here in a minute. So if you know the body feedback system, you'll be able to figure out like, okay, where is it most important to help this person? Maybe their liver doesn't work right and their colon is just fine. So you got you to gotta be able to ask the body because the person isn't going to know, I can guarantee you. And, you know, we can use our education and make our best educated guess, but it's still kind of an educated guess. I feel like asking the body to tell me is, um, is the best way to find out these things um, without having to spend a bunch of money on labs. And because you can see it in labs and I've got some labs to show you guys, but I'm all about like, let's, let's get the most efficient treatments for the, the least amount of hassle and the least amount of cost. So uh, that's where I find just using this body feedback testing techniques gives me the answers and, and it works really well. And just in general, I have about an 80% success rate with infertility, um, which is very, very high in our industry, 75, 80 percent is very high. Um, it's, I think that last 20 percent that I can't get to is people that unfortunately have been permanently altered due to uh, exposure in utero. Um, so I am very passionate about sharing this information with you guys because I feel like our profession can make a huge difference with, with infertility. So there's it. Okay, so are we at lunch break yet? No, we got, yeah, we can get through these last couple slides and then we'll take a 10 minute little break. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease refers to the accumulation of excess fat in the liver, not due to excess alcohol consumption. Insulin resistance and obesity are associated with increased lipid influx out of the way. Yeah, increased lipid influx into the liver, promoting hepatic triglyceride accumulation. So basically fat, stores in fat, stores of fat, and then the endocrine disrupting chemicals are stored in that fat. The prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is up 30% in developed countries and nearly 10% in developing nations, making non-alcoholic fatty liver disease the most common liver condition in the world. So it's basically compromised detoxification. And I believe that it's associated with these endocrine disrupting chemicals. So early life exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals may play a role in non-alcoholic fatty liver development later in life. So they're starting to see this in studies. Exposure to uh, non-phenol, NP, a known endocrine disrupting chemical combined with high sucrose, high fat diet accelerates and exacerbates the development of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease caused by NP exposure. 
So this is the whole metabolic syndrome with PCOS, basically, is what I think. So they have compromised liver detoxification. And some people with a high fat, high sugar diet will develop this fatty liver disease pretty quickly. Symptoms of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, anxiety, upper abdominal pain, sleep disorders, thirst, warming sensations, fatigue or daytime sleepiness, gastrointestinal problems, bloating, and defecation disturbances, which I guess would be diarrhea, I'm guessing, urgent. So this is, um, could non-alcoholic fatty liver disease be correlated to chronic skin issues? Yes, it can. Um, the chronic skin issues, I honestly think too, is exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals directly on the skin too. Um, and then people, sometimes they have um, liver detoxification issues, sometimes they don't. Both of my case studies have skin issues, chronic skin issues. The second one, I didn't really talk about it that much, um, but I'll, I'll share it with you more. But the first case study has got this autoimmune kind of response to her clothing, to the plastics, probably the BPAs in the clothing or something in the clothing, and her liver is actually okay. So it, it could, I definitely think that endocrine disrupting chemicals are a part of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but non-alcoholic fatty liver disease doesn't have to be a part of the endocrine disrupting chemical scenario. So we'll see, um, we'll see both today actually. How much of it is related to diet versus EDH, endocrine disruptive hormones? I think it depends on the genetics. Like some people's genetics are in such uh, a compromised state to begin with. Um, and I actually talk about that in tomorrow's class quite a bit because there's a lot of genetics that come into play with EMF sensitivity. But there's certain detoxification pathways that are more problematic for certain family groups and genetics. Um, and then, you know, there's always the question, well, are the families all eating the same crappy food or is it their genetics or is it a common combination of both? So, and are liver enzyme blood tests enough to determine the health of a liver? The liver enzyme test definitely will um, indicate if there's a tendency towards non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That's one of the first signs is you have the elevated enzymes. What I find a lot is that the liver can be overburdened and storing a lot of toxins because the colon doesn't work right and the end stage of detoxification is not working right. So the liver is forced to store it or the kidneys aren't able to handle the end stages of detoxification. So so the liver actually is kind of like more the beginning and middle stages, and then it still has to get out of the body. If those end stages aren't working right, either in from the kidneys or the colon, then the toxins just keep recirculating and recirculating. So the liver does its best to store them, and then it'll store them in these fatty nodules in the lower back. We're gonna talk about that in detail today too, but it'll store them in these fatty nodules or in the low back or around the body, or it'll store it in fat cells and cause people to gain weight. And it looks like the liver and the liver gets like blamed for most of it, but it's really farther down the detoxification pathways that's not working, which is why we got to be able to ask the body where the problem is. See, hopefully guys are getting like, the body's really complex and it, it can look like the liver, but it's not. And so that's where I think um, having a labs is helpful because sometimes if the labs look good, but the person's still pretty toxic, they're still having a lot of issues, then it's, then the body's storing it in the fat cells, which is then disrupting the, the hormones more. So then you, you would know to look more at the end stages of detoxification than the liver's role. Asking because I have chronic skin issues that have been 
recently being triggered erratically and having a difficult time identifying the cause, wondering if there's a deeper compounded problem. Um, you know what would be really fun is if we go through the class and the first case study is on the skin person, and then whoever just asked that, Christina Lee, um, if on some of these little breaks or lunch, you could go and test some of your stuff. That might be kind of fun to see. And then I could kind of help you too. And non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has definitely got a genetic component. Um, unfortunately, foods and chemicals in our environments are causing snippets in the genes, which are basically mutations that are associated with diseases. So genetically, people who have not the best genetics, you could say, or compromised like liver detoxification genetics, basically what's happening for them is um, the more chemicals they're exposed to and the more problems they're exposed to is triggering more snippets, making their genetics even worse. And then that gets passed on to future generations. And then it's just compounding the infertility problems. Okay. And then also guys, people that get warm flushes, especially if they're going through menopause. So I know this is a fertility class, but we're just going to talk about it really quick. Most women that have hot flashes during the day, or if they get hot flashes, like right after they get into bed, you got to look at, are they using a lot of polyester clothing because, or is there a lot of polyester in their sheets? Because for women after menopause, remember the skin is the largest organ of absorption and those BPAs are absorbed through the skin that that will trigger the um, hot flash. What they think is a, a low estrogen hot flash is actually the liver's all backed up with these endocrine disrupting chemicals um, causing them to now have higher cholesterol and all these postmenopausal problems. So... So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and male fertility, the non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease male patients exposed, experienced significantly decreased uh, lower sperm quality and reproductive hormones compared with the control group. So that's where we're going to see the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease affecting fertility for men. Multivariant analysis showed sperm concentration, count, and motility were significantly associated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There were no significant differences we, uh, were observed in semen volume or morphology, size and shape. But we can see sperm concentration, sperm count, and motility were all affected. So, um, sometimes it's hard to get the guys on board when dealing with fertility. How many people here, if you're dealing with infertility or repeat miscarriage, have the, the male partner come in for an evaluation? I'm just curious. What I learned after a few years in practice, always, always, yep, is critical. I always make them come in, even if it's just to check their tongue, check their pulse, check a bunch of different areas on their body um, to, to look for red flags, that might be a problem. Oh, good. I'm glad to see that people are doing that. That's great. Good. That's fabulous. Yeah. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and PCOS, the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is increased in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome and the presence of NAFLD is associated with higher serum androgen levels in addition to obesity and insulin resistance. So people with PCOS is kind of like a double whammy. So people with PCOS have to be willing to make major lifestyle changes and be committed to their health long-term for the fertility treatments to work. So I get really serious with them and I say, look, you're gonna have to change your diet. Well, I first look and see what they're doing, but obviously it's not working for them if they're at my clinic, right? So I tell them they're going to have to probably make major lifestyle changes, diet changes, 
We're going to have to look at a few different things in order for this to work and make sure they're really committed because I don't want to waste their time and money and I don't want to waste my time and money. So sometimes I'm pretty direct with the PCOS clients right up front. Um, I do a phone screening before I actually let people get on the schedule um, because I want to screen out stuff that I know I'm not going to be able to help or, or is not a good fit for my clinic. And so with people with polycystic ovarian syndrome, I will just let them know right off the bat that, that they're going to have to start making all these changes. I'm going to want them to do all these things even before they come for their first appointment and make sure that they're really committed. And every once in a while, there'll be people that aren't committed to making that much change in their life and they don't come, which is a good thing. Okay. PCOS women with hyperandrogenism, which is the uh, excessive male hormones, the classic phenotype, have a higher prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease compared to women with PCOS um, without hyperandrogenism. So are you guys familiar with this whole new issue where there's this PCOS type that has the higher androgen levels and then the PCOS type that doesn't. I, I think when I first started in the industry, they called it like a syndrome X, um, but basically their endocrine system don't work right and they don't have too many male hormones, but it, it looks like PCOS. And I think these are just basically endocrine disrupting chemicals that have caused this dysfunction. Okay, great. So Christina, extra notes. I'm in my mid thirties. My skin flare ups are associated with insomnia, night sweats, overheating, altered appetite, irregular cycles. Okay, good, Christina. Thank you for that information. I definitely think it's related to hormones um, because her skin flare ups are associated with insomnia, night sweats, overheating, altered appetite. Those are all heat signs. Um, it could be actually that and or some of the EMF toxicity too. Um, we're going to have you check your water, your phone, and some of your clothes on lunch. Okay. Okay. Beta glucuronidase. Okay. We can get through this in 10 minutes and then we'll take our little break. Beta glucuronidase and detoxification. This is basically the detoxification that he occurs from the colon. Beta-glucuronidase is an enzyme marker that measures activity indicating toxins that were processed by the liver are being recirculated and reabsorbed in the colon, okay? So this happens to more people than I think we realize unless you know to look for this. Um, and how I figured it out is because often a good portion of my people that look like they're liver toxic all the time, actually, I'm always doing colon treatments on them. And that when I get them on the right probiotics, then we can move to deeper levels of healing and restoration. But until I address the colon issues, they're stuck with detoxification. So I know that this is probably a pretty big thing in your practice, and you guys are going to learn how to screen for it. Um. So beta-glucuronidase, okay, it's basically an enzyme that indicates that there's a toxic overload that's being reabsorbed in the body, okay? So it's not a good thing to have. Phase two liver detoxification adds glucuronic acid to the toxins to limit resorption. So glucuronic acid is a good thing, okay? beta glucuronidase breaks down the glucuronic bond and basically undoes the phase two liver detoxification of hormones, EDCs, environmental toxins, mold mycotoxins, and medications. So basically the liver is detoxifying um, these, these chemicals and harmful substances, and it adds glucuronic acid. But for some people, if they can't reabsorb, if they can't get it out of their body, then their body starts making this elevated beta-glucuronidase enzyme, which then causes it to be reabsorbed and recirculated. And then the liver just keeps trying to dump it, 
keeps trying to get rid of it. If it can't get rid of it because the colon has got a problem, it, like I said, it just ends up storing in fat cells or storing in the liver. Possible reasons for elevated beta-glucuronidase is bacterial overgrowth of E. coli, clostridium, bacteriorides, staphylococcus, ruminococcus, eubacterium, and peptostreptococcus. So basically small bowel bacteria overgrowth um, and some extra uh, pathogenic bacteria in the colon is what it looks like. Um, we can see it on lab tests pretty easily, but we can all, you can also learn how to test the body feedback system to kind of flag that there might be a problem there. We also have a lack of beneficial flora, either a lack of production, um, which causes a lack of production of short chain fatty acids. So some people genetically um, have low beneficial flora levels. So I'm just curious how many people here are using DNA analysis, DNA testing in their practice? I like it. It's the foot gene, the FUT gene or grouping of genes has to do with how, how somebody's beneficial bacteria um, is functioning basically is, is based on the foot genes. Cause I'll know, I'll know how much to talk about gene stuff with you guys. If I know how many people are actually using it in your practice already. Also antibiotic use um, can kill off the short chain fatty acids and the healthy bacteria. So some people that were given a lot of antibiotics when they were kids um, have literally wiped out strains of their good flora. Um, and they're more prone to this liver stress. So that'll be your non-alcoholic fatty liver disease um, and any kind of extra burden on the liver. So if somebody's drinking like, I hate to say this, but filtered water with just like a activated carbon filter that like is comes in their fridge. A lot of that, if they are living in a polluted uh, water region, it's not going to, it's not going to cut it. So if they're constantly hydrating themselves with toxins, is it going to cause liver stress? So for the DNA testing, I use um, uh, dnasupplementation.com uh, and it's Bob Miller and he does these free webinar trainings on Thursdays. And then he also has like a certification program if you're wanting to um, learn more about it. He, I think he gives the first four classes for free. And then after that, you can pay for it, which is a really nice way to do it because then you can see if you even like it. Um, but I've learned so much from him. Um, that's the one I like. Kind of like a Brita filter, but I didn't want to say that. <laughs> yes, like a Brita filter. Um, so yeah, so I really have gotten a lot from his classes. So dietary factors, high protein, high meat, and fat and low fiber. Okay, what does high protein, high meat, and high fat diet with low fiber sound like? Sounds like the keto diet, doesn't it? The ketogenic diet. So this is a big problem for people who have issues with their colon. If they go to do the keto diet, um, these are the people that don't do well on keto um, and they need more of a high fiber diet. Yeah, here. I think it's, let me type this in, DNA supplementation. I think that's my favorite place. And they actually do the DNA testing off the grid um, so that the people own their own DNA and it's not shared. So like if, if people are getting DNA testing through 23andMe or Ancestry.com, do you guys realize that Ancestry.com and 23andMe owns their DNA rights, which is kind of scary. So um, for some people who don't want to do that, they won't do DNA testing, but um, Bob Miller's organization is very private, kind of off the grid, and they're designed to the person owns their DNA rights, basically. Uh, I don't know, but I like, so... Do you guys remember, like, they caught that one killer in California that was killing people because 
they were able to get some of the DNA. Well, not that you guys are killers or people are killers, but basically they got some DNA and they ran it through the ancestry.com or 23andMe. I can't remember which one they ran it through their database and they had a DNA match. So like the government and the police can use DNA that they find and run it through those organizations too. Um, I don't know what people would do with, with, with my DNA. I have no idea what they'd want to do with my DNA. Um, yeah, 23andMe. I um, personally did do 23andMe. So, and another thing you can do is you can take your 23andMe data and you can run it through um, Bob Miller's program and it will um, do an analysis of it too. So they can have outside sources like 23andMe run the DNA reports too, but 23andMe is not releasing all this, the information like they used to in the raw data. I have to look and see, I've got one to run. Maybe I'll run it tonight for tomorrow. Um, yeah. So the 23andMe report didn't seem that accurate. We could have a, let's have a conversation on one of the breaks about this because I don't want to take up too much time, but I'm glad you guys are really interested in it because I would be happy to like do some type of class if Elotus wants me to on understanding how to use the 20 or how to use the DNA for TCM treatments. So we'll talk about that more on, on lunch. Okay. So there we go. Let's go to the next slide. Elevated beta-glucuronidase and hormones. Um, BPA and other EDCs are cleared through the glucuronidase pathway. So that's why this is so important. And that's why colon health will make all the difference for your clients. Hormones are cleared through glucuronidase pathways. Elevated beta-glucuronidase may cause estrogen dominance, which can lead to endometriosis and breast cancer. Um, so there's some studies on that. Uh, reducing beta-glucuronidase activity. First thing that we're going to look at with case study number two is reducing bacterial overgrowth. And actually some people's genetics are more prone to bacterial overgrowth. So how many people are familiar with the whole concept of the gut-brain connection for mental health? And that the neurotransmitters that are made in the small intestine affect the enteric nervous system, which affects mental health. Right, great. So everybody's on board with that. There's actually genes that regulate often how much um, bacterial overgrowth people have. And that's why mental illness, I think, runs in families because the problems with the bacterial overgrowth is genetic. And then that runs in families. So people think, oh, it's just mental illness running in the family when it's actually, it's excess bacterial overgrowth and lack of B vitamin, B6 usually um, issues that have a lot to do with like mental illness. So, so this is really important. So that's where probiotics are really helpful for mental illness too. Um, but the, the problem is, how do we know which probiotic is the right probiotic to give them? Because everybody's so different. Um, and I, in my practice, I carry like five or six different types of probiotics. Like I wish I could carry one or two that worked for everybody, but it doesn't work that way in clinical practice. Um, and we'll talk about that more today, but I can use the body feedback testing to tell me which is the right probiotic for a person. And it works really great. And the people can tell a difference when you test supplements using the body feedback system, I can guarantee your clients will tell, be able to tell that those products are working for them because mine tell me all the time, Oh, I ran out of this supplement or that supplement. I can really tell Michelle, I, this is the first time I've ever taken supplements that I know they're actually doing something for me. I hear that all the time, at least once or twice a week when somebody runs out of something because they didn't refill it on time or whatever. So we also have to increase short chain, chain fatty acid bacteria with fiber and prebiotics. That's where I think a lot of people with PCOS really would do much better on the um, Mediterranean diet. 
do you, how many people here use designs for health products and how many people have access to their well, well world website where they provide, I think it's like over 18 or 20 different meal plans to give to clients. Are you guys familiar with that? This has saved my butt in practice from not having to spend too much time on nutritional education. I just sign them up on the well world. I send them the PDFs. Hopefully you guys are, are doing that with the, um, the meal plans. Do you guys, let me know who's doing the meal plans. Cause this is like a savior. Please help me. Yeah. Okay. I'll, um, so I'll put together, um, yeah, designs for health, their well world meal plans. Okay, so that's where I get people on the right diet is I use those meal plans from Designs for Health. And uh, usually it's the cardio metabolic that I use. Um, adding the right probiotic, we just talked about reducing exposure to toxins and EDCs, which is really important. And the, I think the most toxic exposure comes from food and water and clothes. Food, water, clothes, food, water, clothes. That's all I talk about with new patients every day. Um, and with my long-term patients, I have to, and you guys are probably going to have to bring this up in your practice and we'll talk about how to do that. Um, how to introduce this into your practice to get practical, um, application out of this. You can add a supplement called calcium deglucurate if the person is estrogen dominant. Um, and this works great for menopause women, um, because you want hormones to circulate, so, Right. You need new estrogen and new hormones, and then you need to get rid of the old ones. If it's for fertility enhancement, there's a particular type of probiotic that works for increasing the, um, this uh, detoxification through the colon. And then if they're, if they're menopausal and, or they're not trying to get pregnant and you want to do some quick cleansing of estrogen, um, EDCs, estrogen or endocrine disrupting chemicals, you can use this calcium deglucurate. And then you wanna support liver function and detoxification. Okay. Where are we at? Oh, we went over. Uh, let's do one last slide. Elevated beta glucuronidase activity is associated with increased risk for various cancers, particularly hormone dependent cancers such as breast, prostate, and colon cancers. <clears throat> Foods high in Glucuronic acid, oranges, apples, grapefruit, and cruciferous vegetables can help reduce beta-glucuronidase activity. Regulation of estrogen is another clinical application of oral calcium deglucurate. I'm going to leave this slide up because we're going to talk about this because this is critical with dealing with people trying to get pregnant is the cruciferous vegetables. So we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about that and then answer some questions. You guys can take 13 minutes, okay? So we will return in 13 minutes, depending on what your time zone is, but um, to resume. So uh, I'll go through and see if I can screen some of these questions too and get some water. See you in 13. <laughs>